Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Thank you for coming out. Um, I, I feel deeply moved to be here. Um, this is a, a subject that has become uh, ever more complex and deep and important to me in the last few days since I've been here. And thank you, Daryl and Beth and family and, and, and Andy for all these conversations that have been uh, helpful for me intellectually, um, but, but uh, deeply and spiritually as well. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm truly honored, um, Auntie Janet, that you're here this evening. Um, and I'm looking forward to sitting at your feet later to, to, to learn from you. Uh, but I want to, uh, oh, I'm supposed to give greetings from Regent's Park Baptist, Reg Regent's Park College, that's where I work, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, from the Baptist Union of Great Britain as well. But I want to uh, begin by sharing a couple of stories with you, first of all. Um, I don't put these on to look like Bono, uh, I just have a bit of an eye issue. <laughs> Last year, my wife, Becca, and I spent a few days celebrating our 10-year anniversary, and I'd always wanted to go to Rome. Um, not so much because of the Christian thing, but because of the, the Roman thing, particularly the Gladiator thing. And, and Gladiator is one of my all-time favorite films, and so I wanted to check that out. Um, and I'd heard that the Colosseum is breathtaking to behold. Uh, as well as the Pantheon and other ancient sites, um, and, and they were. Um, I even found out whilst we were there that they sometimes used to flood the stadium and have water fights, uh, which involved hippos and, and various other things. Oh, that's my family, by the way. Um, have I turned this on? Yeah, I have. So that's my wife, Becca, and then Micah, who's seven, and Boaz, who's five. And they're monsters, and they're wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah, back to Rome. Whilst we were there, um, we thought we'd do the ecumenical thing. Um, and we visited St. Peter's Basilica, as well as the Vatican. I don't know if anyone's been to Rome. Yeah. yeah. And after passing through the security checks to enter the smallest and pretty much richest country in the world, we came to the foot of a spiral path that ascended upwards. And along the way of this winding walkway, there were displays and pictures of different boats from all around the world. But at the very foot of this ascent, there was a sign explaining the significance of this exhibition. And I've, I've underlined part of it. It says that the boats represent the civilizations of humankind. They are witness to the historical attention, the curiosity and the respect of the Catholic universe toward non-European cultures. They symbolize the destiny of the Church of Rome, that is, Peter's boat, in the journey toward the salvation of all. Now, it was maybe wrong to interpret the sign the way I did, but it appeared to be equating the Catholic universe and its Roman Catholic optic with European culture. And therefore, equating the salvation of the world with the Christian West. This is a stark vision of Christian imperialism, one that should make Many of us Baptists, I hope, more than a little uncomfortable. But before I my nonconformist high horse, because that's always a little bit grotesque, uh, I want to tell you one more story, one which is a bit more personal and a bit more uh, or a bit less systemic. And it's a story that, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have told you I wouldn't have even felt was worth telling you 10 years ago. In fact, 10 years ago, I may not have even perceived that what happened to be able to tell you about it. 
It was very recent. It was Thursday, the 10th of November, 2023, so less than a year ago. And I was walking along the cold streets of Aberdeen city centre. You guys don't know what it means to be cold. <laughs> I was due to offer at the university uh, based on a book I'd recently published and I'd just spent a wonderful evening um, of theological discussion over food and drink with many of the staff and students where much of the conversation revolved around this subject of race and this term called whiteness which we'll come on to. The sun had set over Aberdeen, but the streets were well lit, open, wide and steadily populated. I felt safe and relaxed as I walked back home to my hotel. Now, whilst waiting at some traffic lights, I observed a, a shadow just behind me and I glanced momentarily over my shoulder to notice another person waiting to cross as well. They weren't very close. Uh, their presence and their manner weren't obtrusive or, or aggressive at all. And there was nothing conspicuous about them whatsoever. In fact, there was absolutely nothing in that quick glance that would legitimize any rational basis for alarm. However, I did sense something, something visceral, a bodily agitation, an uncomfortable feeling of caution, a lack of safety even, a sudden hypervigilance. Only minutes beforehand, another person had been close behind me, but I hadn't felt anything. And I think that this immediate and irrational reflex, which I tried to hide, probably occurred for two reasons. First, this man behind me was black. But second, I am white. Now I share these two stories with you to in indicate something of what I'm reflecting on and wrestling through as an academic theologian, but moreover as a disciple of Jesus. There are, I believe, numerous assumptions that we make in the white Western church, whether Catholic, Protestant or, or whatever, about what it means to be a Christian, but also what it means to be human. And these assumptions need to be recognized, reflected on, and in some instances, repented of. But also, I think we, or, or I, must attend to and interrogate what on earth is going on in my consciousness and in my body that leads me to live and to move and to have my being in a way that sometimes deforms the image of Christ in me as well as in others in this world. Think about the classic sin of othering people and dehumanizing those who we frame as different. But to just talk about the other it, it is sometimes not specific enough and therefore easy to evade. <clears throat> I think one of the key ways that the sin of othering manifests itself, certainly in many UK churches and theological institutions, is through the deformative story of race. In my work, I'm, I'm asking how people like me might wake up to this issue in myself and learn to resist and repent of what is clearly at times a, a racialized reflex guiding my conscious and my unconscious thoughts and actions. In certain spaces, perhaps the language of racism or being racist can feel sometimes a bit loaded and unhelpful because it, it seems intense and accusatory and lacking in nuance. And we like nuance, don't we? 
So maybe the language of racialization and racialized behavior might be more helpful for thinking constructively about this conversation regarding a subject which can sometimes be difficult for some of us white folks to engage with. At the heart of it, though, I believe there are dogmas and, and stories narrated upon and, and within my life and my body, as well as my communal spaces that hinder my witness both to and, and of Christ because of this thing called race. I may be the only one but I doubt it. For many people in Great Britain and, and in parts of the world today, the topic of race often evokes images of people who bear a skin complexion that is, broadly speaking, dark. And in some ways, the impulse to think of such people is understandable. When race is talked about or written about, the sources often come from those who would generally describe themselves as, as black or, or brown. Now, for many people who live within black or brown skin, the subject of race is important. Race is an inescapable phenomenon for numerous folks, as it carries tremendous implications regarding their self-understanding, whether they want it to or not. But most white people still don't think specifically about being white, when it comes to the subject of race, regarding it instead as a subject that relates to those people and not to us or, or to me. In other words, the subject of race does not strike many white folks as something directly related to one's whiteness. And this is something I want to address this evening. This um, pretty short publication that was commissioned by the Whitley Trust uh, is structured in two main parts. At the beginning, I offer a, a kind of prelude where I introduce the subject of race and the language of whiteness, as well as my method of reflecting on what it means to be white, which I try to do very much at the feet of black and womanist theologies and experiences. I explore some of the fragmentary ways by which whiteness is operative, specifically in the UK in terms of um, aesthetics, but broader speaking as well in terms of our arrangements and our attitudes. And to summarize this part, um, and it's not merely, merely it's not conclusive or, or uh, comprehensive, but there are many assumptions that we can make sometimes as people in general, um, but particularly as white people and as white Christians in the West. And these assumptions can, can govern and are governed by various norms. Or, or tropes. The racialized moorings of whiteness <laughs> range from thousands of tiny and seemingly banal things like skin colored plasters um, to the sweeping presumption of universally perceived to be moral or ethical. And the lack of people like me often navigate the particular. Uh, desires and orientation that we have to the world, it can sometimes constitute a very distorted vision of humanity as a whole because it make it difficult for others around me to breathe. A British black theologian, Robert Beckford, identifies whiteness as ideas, myths and language Sorry, the way that ideas, myths, and language are used to ensure that white skin color is represented in a particular superior way. Now, we may not consciously or, or, or intentionally live like this, uh, but black theology, amongst other disciplines, challenges the common predisposition of, of white people to interpret a person's skin color as well as their cultural background, including their vocation and their disposition in general, in relation to what is often seen as normal or neutral or at the center of things. To summarize that, that whole section, um, whiteness confers purpose, peace, and power. <laughs> 
upon those who fit the white script, whilst it defers the purpose, peace and power of those who are not white. I then share a brief interlude, um, reflecting on my own experience of waking up to my whiteness. But part two of this little book offers a theological reading of Gethsemane, from which I'm going to um, draw for the rest of my presentation today. So we're going to look at that story together. I'm sure many of you know that when Jesus enters the Garden of Gethsemane, The word made flesh laments uh, in both word and flesh. We know that it's within and through the body that the brain crafts and reframes one's memories and self-understanding. Jesus is overwhelmed and to an extent at least, his being overwhelmed is revelatory of who he is. Now, for some of us, this moment in Gethsemane may seem a bit uncharacteristic of the Jesus who exhibited an almost unthinking resilience against Satan in the wilderness. Here in this particular place, he halts in a state of terror and he turns to his father in heaven, though also and first, did you notice, he turns to his friends. And Jesus demonstrates a very real and human need. He needs those close to him to pray, to remain awake and resist temptation, whatever that might be. He's under no illusion that it would be stoic and self-enclosed to try and handle this on his own. The event where our Lord faces the visceral temptation that might incline him towards fight or flight, he appeals instead to his friends, seeking an intimate relational bond through their companionship. He doesn't become introspective, but he seeks fellowship with those who have a different space to him, clearly. But he loves to be seen for his oppression and his unfathomable fear to be shared. In much of the white Western world, there has been an aversion in much theological discourse regarding the finitude and human vulnerability of Jesus as something that we hate. In theological education, where I'm based, for example, the teacher or the tutor is often posited as the unreachable, self-sufficient sage who imparts wisdom and knowledge to the students in a one-directional manner. Not only that, but the, the persona of the teacher is modelled as an exemplification of what it means to be mature, to be strong, successful, faithful even. And so, humanity is equated in theological education with not needing others, with being better than others and having all the answers. However, nothing could be further from the truth, not least because without the students, we do not get paid. <laughs> but more deeply, the, the best teachers are primarily learners themselves, called as fellow disciples, fellow humans, to be receptive to the fresh ideas and experiences and angles brought into that space and to inspire wise questions. I think we should become nervous when any of us white theologians think we fully understand the problems and complexities of race and colonization or of diversity in general. In Gethsemane, the irony is that the disciples need Jesus as much as they ever have. But the scandal of this story is that he appears to them now as their salvation precisely in his need and in his struggle. It seems that to acknowledge our need of others in experiences of vulnerability, mutuality and sorrow, 
it, it is to imitate and in many senses to inhabit Christ himself. No matter how much of a nuisance he might seem. Jesus always told his disciples to not be afraid, but here it's striking that he is terrified. Jesus then prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. The enfleshed Son of God prays to the Father, offering his request while resolutely committed to the will of God. And his profound humanness is, is almost lost on some of us at times, I think. Simply put, Jesus does not want to suffer in and of itself. He does not want to be God forsaken or crucified in and of itself. He's not stupid. And his traumatic petition is not a moment where he's verging on unfaithfulness. Rather, it is, it is perfect faithfulness that turns to God alone for an answer, while recognising he may not receive an answer terms or an answer at all. Dietrich Bonhoeffer opines somewhat paradoxically, Jesus prays to the Father that the cup pass from him and the Father hears the Son's prayer. The cup of suffering will pass from Jesus, but only by his drinking it. The Gospel of Luke writes that an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Here, Jesus is almost psychologically and physiologically debilitated, sweating red blood through his body his flesh driven to dark weeping. Andrew Dalton discusses this phenomenon known as hematidrosis. He says, this is when your subcutaneous capillaries become distended and burst, not because anybody's beating up on you, but because the fear of death the idea that what Jesus was about to face is present to him such that his blood vessels explode. This is the hemorrhage underneath the surface of the skin that now exits out of the adjacent seat pores, creating little drops of red blood on the surface of the skin, leaving the biggest organ in your body sensitive to touch in a new way. So that even if you blow air over the surface of the skin, after having suffered hematidrosis, that would register in your body as physical pain. The first physical contact Jesus has after this horrendous experience is to be kissed by his friend and betrayer, Judas. Trauma relates inseparably to human physiology. Delroy Hall, uh, the British Afro-Caribbean theologian, points towards epigenetics as an emerging field of medical research that may prove useful for understanding or at least for appreciating the intergenerational imprint of racism that is written upon some black people. And he refers to Rachel Yehuda, who is one of the pioneers of epigenetic research. In her studies, Yehuda discovered similar hormonal profiles between survivors of the Holocaust and Vietnam veterans suffering from PTSD. And Yehuda later carried out a study of the children of these survivors finding that, and I quote, Holocaust offspring had the same hormonal abnormalities that were viewing in Holocaust survivors and persons with PTSD. And if I've lost you there, Yehuda's research is 
suggestive of the possibility that traumatic experiences within individuals and people groups may have an impact that is not just environmentally effective on how they relate to their offspring. Trauma may be transcriptionally determinative of the neurology and the physiology of their children. This is a risky hypothesis and it could easily be weaponized on political lines and could be stretched as Yanis Pitsiladis shows. Yet, what if the rupture within the psyche and the body of a black person when they sense some sort of racialized or racist behavior, what if it's not irrational and oversensitive but a present remembering of a reality that was scripted upon the bodies of their ancestors who were treated in ways that some of us can barely imagine and really don't like thinking about, passed down viscerally. Hence, Delroy Hall observes what has often been felt by the offspring from those previously traumatized is as though they experienced that trauma firsthand. And he's writing as a descendant of the Windrush generation, people whose ancestors were obviously brought as slaves from Africa. And this insight is, I think, particularly painful and helpful for us within contexts that are alleged to be places of welcome, like churches, like theological education institutions. Attempts to merely rationalize someone's experience away, I think, fails to recognize that this is far more than a, a rational issue in its most basic sense. The psych, um, psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk explains that funneling a person's trauma into notions of reason and rationality only compounds that trauma further. And I'm sure we have other forms of trauma that some of us might relate to in that regard. The writer to the Hebrews says that in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. In Gethsemane, Jesus' body is contorted, but his Fleshly anxiety is only part of the terror. Jesus must reckon with the cross. Something terrible and godless as the dark avenue for bloody faithfulness to the Father. This sort of obedience is dreadfully counterintuitive. Jesus longs not to be separated from God's will. From his prayer, it would seem that Jesus' Father in heaven, the God of light and life and love, has called him to be handed over, to suffer and to die for the world as one who is innocent. Is there not any other way? Is the world really this evil? Is God really at work here somehow? Really? Could any conceivable purpose or, or beauty be wrought out of this horror story? I think Jesus is oppressed in the most harrowing and devastating sense here. We could so easily gloss over the, the mental abyss looming over Jesus' consciousness and his conscience, which the gospel writers clearly want us to linger over. And Jesus would be a masochist, he'd be a sicko, if he did not recoil from the horrific prospect before him that, that God works and is somehow present in the midst of evil. Jesus prays so that he might be faithful, and anything other than this would be far too unhuman for the incarnate Son of God. If there is anything objective here, it is that something dreadfully wrong 
and evil and painful is going to happen to Jesus. And it's going to happen within the religious and the political and the moral sensibilities of a world that will regard it as objectively reasonable. Jesus is being called to take a lead part in this script so that through him, God might expose, usurp and judge the hell out of the script that attempts to make his suffering objective. For many black folks, objectivity has been really difficult to challenge because of the so-called reasonable nature of the racialized script that is whiteness. Trying to rationally and objectively discuss this subject calmly, (laughs) as well as other theological themes such as the doctrines of providence, Christology, creation and other key themes, that plays into the heart of the problem. After all, Christ's own obedience is not reducible to the merely objective, the reasonable or even the rational. Objectively, given who he is, Christ's reasonable. And however doctrinally coherent we may understand his passion to be, and I teach Christian doctrine, I love it, it nevertheless remains deeply dreadful. And it must be told so as to awake and to disturb us. Because for many, suffering is a daily reality. Uh, not an idea. Now, contrary to what most white biblical commentators have done, and I haven't read them all, I would suggest that we cannot witness Jesus's wakeful prayer in isolation from the disciples' sleep. Reading Jesus against his disciples yields some really helpful reflections, I think, for attending to the elusive and often ignored ramifications of sin in general. But for this project in particular, I want to think about the stupor of racial slumber, which I, for one, often fall into. Luke 22, verse 46 reads, When he got up from prayer, Jesus came to the disciples and he found them sleeping from the sorrow. The Greek is apotes lupes. God offers salvation in the form of a neighbor who suffers in sorrow. Now, we must not make the mistake of idealizing suffering in and of itself. No. The point is that Jesus reaches out for help in his suffering and he offers the gift of communion with God by way of their participation. To remain awake with Jesus in the garden would be a stunning and yet poignantly natural response to his relational love and need as a responsive act of love and need for Jesus. But as we know, the disciples do not remain awake with Christ. They do not love him when he needs their love in this way. It's all well and good, isn't it? Loving someone when it's easy. And when they're easy to love on us, when they do not impose upon us or require something untoward or inconvenient from us and when the space that they inhabit does not cause problems for the space that we want to inhabit. But here Jesus does impose. He impresses upon them. He needs something from his friends but they are unresponsive. Perhaps they are more receptive to the Jesus who can turn water into wine, hmm? or who vindicates them against the religious elites, or who makes the sick well, or who appears sparkly, shiny, white on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's maybe a Jesus for whom they could... But the Jesus who 
tearfully sweats and grieves in terror and who asks for help. This is the same Jesus. What is sobering for those of us whites who are seeking to address racial inequality and injustice is that, like the disciples, we can be friends who nevertheless sometimes fail to respond to the needs of our black sisters and brothers appropriately. My relationship with others is a relationship where my being white is, is always imminent. I, I can't ignore that, though I often do. But I can become attentive to it, and, and with help, I can practice a renunciation of my relational clumsiness and, frankly, my ignorance. I don't need to feel overly anxious about not understanding people who aren't white like me, but I can try and understand myself a bit better and understand why I react the way I do. This is something that may be particularly worthwhile for white men, actually, as a recent report from Project Violet in the Baptist Union of Great Britain would suggest. It may seem uh, somewhat natural for the disciples to fall into a communal stupor in the garden. And it is easy to sleep. In fact, sleep is not remotely problematic if you're jet lagged. <laughs> Nor is it problematic for those who are affected by trauma, who are, sorry, who are not affected by trauma. But for those who bear trauma within their bodies, Sleep is a terrifying prospect sometimes because the brain is unable to process difficult situations through the rapid eye movement stage or the REM sleep as a means of ordering and, and healing from daily experiences. For many black folks, experiences of discrimination and trauma have been really difficult to voice because of the detached objectivity with which whiteness often responds reasonably. Our limited white horizons sometimes don't, don't prompt the, the receptivity that we need to racial inequality and injustice. But it, our whiteness can sometimes engender a kind of logical apathy amidst very concrete situations that would call for a greater wakefulness on our part. And this isn't due to a lack of effort, but it's due to take it seriously within a, a paradigm that seeks to know and understand it within the confines of reason and an isolated, disembodied way of knowing, or epistemology, if you want the word. And that's often our left hemispheric part of our brain which kind of dominates that. You could say that we see, but perhaps do not perceive what's going on. To give you some concrete examples, a globally renowned black academic feels uncomfortable having to deal with the burglar alarm in their theological institution in case the police come. And yet they are told that they're being oversensitive and don't need to worry about it. A black pastor, known for their service in the local community, enters a shop and yet is followed by someone very closely, just in case they steal something. A black man is in an elevator, dressed in a suit for an important meeting, and as the doors open, the enter the lift, decides to take the stairs, struggling to carry all of her heavy belongings with her. A black minister in training is part of a preaching seminar and after having, had, after having her opportunity to practice preaching, she's told that she needs to work on her dialect to make it more neutral so that white people can understand her more easily. A brown-skinned man rides as a passenger in, in a car with his friend through town, but the police pulled them over, suggesting that the passenger of the car wasn't wearing a seatbelt. 
which he most definitely was. And finally, a white person walks into their favorite coffee shop, this time with a black friend, but becomes acutely aware that everyone seems to be looking at them. Discreetly, but most definitely, no doubt with the reasonable assumption that staring is not in and of itself racist. Now, so many of these incidents occur at an alarming and incrementally exhausting amount in the UK. Compressing the exclusion and the sense of repression that many black and brown people feel in spaces that snooze away in racial slumber, carrying on with business as usual, where whites are well-meaning, but often ignorant due to a dramatically different experience of embodiment in the world around them, where white creaturely integrity is not questioned, it's not threatened, and it's certainly not assailed by this light sleeping, but it embraces it. Jesus responds to the stupor of his friends by waking them up, doesn't he? A few times, chiding them to an extent, but he eventually appears to accept carrying out his vocation alone. There's only so many times that a white person can be called to wake up to race before those who alert us to it grow weary of asking again and again and again. And despite Jesus' exhausting persistence, the disciples do not do what he asks them to do. As a collective of individuals, they're disobedient. I imagine it would have been easier and, and so much better to be positive and proactive about following Jesus when he did all the cool stuff. The desire in his followers for something exotic and astonishing. The powerful and utilitarian Jesus would be worth associating with. But in Gethsemane, they are asked to obey Jesus' invitation into his dark space. The terror of Gethsemane lies partly in what we anticipate on Golgotha, but part of the horror, for me at least, is that Jesus reckons with this as one who is already in the process of being disregarded and abandoned unto violence. The violence commences when they enter the garden, when Jesus' mind is contorted with the anticipation of his being handed over. Violence complexifies as the disciples' disobedience compounds his isolation and sorrow, tempting him either towards madness or, or the stoic opiate that is resignation or suicide. The crowd arrives and violence excruciates when his friend assaults Jesus' sensitivities through an arresting kiss. Violence reacts when Peter suddenly rallies because Christ apparently needs a saviour right now to sort it all out for him. And in his zeal, Peter cuts off the right ear of the high priest's slave, a man who has a name. Malchus. Tellingly, Malchus's master, the high priest Caiaphas, is, is absent, having sent his slave into the violence for him. But Jesus is present, and so violence is faced and violated and constrained as Jesus rebukes Peter for his defensiveness and his reactionism and his failure to perceive the word of God who is bleeding through the darkness. Jesus faces the coercion, the imposition, and the force of worldly dominions. He rebukes his friend. He heals his enemy. He embraces who he is. Sometimes obedience to Christ threatens one's anxiety for self-preservation 
and safety. Perhaps Judas realised that better than anyone, actually. For in the end, betraying Christ to serve himself led to his own self-destruction. Complicity in the unjust suffering of others will bring judgment upon those who are complicit. During a year of study at Union Theological Seminary in America, to 1931, Dietrich Bonhoeffer observed a growing opposition amongst many of the young black youth towards Christianity, quote, who see how Christian preaching made their fathers so meek in the face of their incomparably harsh fate. And Bonhoeffer prophetically observed, I quote him again, if this opposition ever spreads its might, then white America will have to take blame for the fact that these black masses became godless. Now, I wrote this specifically in our UK context, but for those of us who might have been quick to dismiss black and brown protests, resistance, and even violence, the black rage that erupts over this subject, I would just ask us to consider that our predominantly white society carries responsibility and guilt for this. When someone is being strangled to death, struggling to breathe amidst the pathos of racial oppression, I for one could never blame them for doing whatever they possibly could to gasp for air again. Aggression, anger and violence from black communities is lamentable. But what's truly devastating is the white church's guilt and self-righteousness to ignore it, and which compels those who suffer to consider violence as the only responsible action. Now, if radical movements like the historical slave uprisings in the Caribbean, as well as the modern black power and Black Lives Matter movements, again, addressing my context, if they don't give us pause for reflection, uh, repentance, and I'm going to say it, reparations, I think we are still asleep in Gethsemane. And we may never experience true reconciliation, friends. There's a lot more to say, uh, but I think I've said enough for my part. There's much about this issue that I don't understand in my own context, let alone here. And coming to this land has illuminated ways uh, of the complexity and the pain that has been caused by my people. But for all of us whites, perhaps one of the things we might find hard about reflecting on our role in the drama of race is that we perhaps need to recognise we're not the masters of this subject. And that's uncomfortable. Willie James Jennings, a Baptist theologian, suggests to possess it in some way as a thing. And if black theology and experiences have taught me anything, it is that black women and men refuse to be possessed by white masters as things, whether physically, economically, geographically, politically, or even epistemologically. So it's my hope, like myself, might navigate the work of our self-reflection and to attend to the joys and the sorrows, the successes and the failures of our being. Trusting without fear that in darkness, whatever form it takes, we might encounter Christ himself provided we're awake to witness him. Amen.